Are you by yourself right now? No, <laughs> I don't mean are you alone. I mean, are you the only one in your organization managing partnerships? I know I am. In that respect, we aren't alone. In a recent survey of 664 professionals by HubSpot and partnership leaders, 59.6% of the respondents reporting having at least one employee working full-time on partner operations. The report went on to share some pretty interesting findings with regard to the size of partner ops, the different kinds of partnerships, and the metrics involved, and the impact all of that has on company revenue. Want to know more? Want to know more? That's what we're covering on today's episode of Partnership Unpacked. This is Partnership Unpacked, your go-to guide to growing your business through partnerships quickly. I'm your host, Mike Alton, and each episode unpacks the winning strategies and latest trends from influencer marketing to brand partnerships and ideas that you can apply to your own business to grow exponentially. And now, the rest of today's episode. Welcome back to Partnership Unpacked, where I selfishly use this time to pick the brains of experts at strategic partnerships, channel programs, affiliates, influencer marketing, and relationship building. Oh, and you get to learn too. Subscribe to learn how you can amplify your growth strategy with a solid takeaway every episode from partnership experts in the industry. But what does that industry really look like? What kinds of partnerships are companies exploring today and how are they managing that? Should you hire more staff? Should you invest in more partner tech? Explore more integrations? That's exactly what our guests today are going to talk to us about. And you and I are lucky because I have twice as many guests as usual in the studio today. Kelly Serabin is the platform ecosystem advocate at HubSpot, where she is responsible for growing the ecosystem through partner content and engagement. Before that, she worked in marketing at Pandium and was a partner at Woden, a branding agency. She believes companies that leverage partnerships and ecosystems can drive more revenue and build stronger brands. And I definitely agree with her on that. Asher Matthew is a co-founder of Partnership Leaders. He's worked in sales, marketing, customer success, and business development, as well as partnerships in venture and bootstrapped businesses. Partnership Leaders is the top community for partnerships and alliance leaders looking to advance their career and improve their partner program. So clearly, we've got the right people on the show today. Hey, Kelly and Asher, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us, Mike. I think that was the best intro we've had, period. And Kelly and I have been doing, I think, like a dozen podcasts now, or maybe more than that. You're definitely the best dressed. Oh, well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. I got dressed up just for you guys. Kelly, how are you doing? I think Kelly froze a little bit, so we'll give her a second to come back in. Oh, there she is. Kelly. Hey, uh, very well. Happy to be here. Love the topic of your show. So happy to dive into all these different issues around ops and partnerships. Fantastic. Now, first of all, I have to say, I loved and appreciated how you pulled this report together. You had logical separations for different aspects of partnership ops and then offered a collection of insights from key experts and executives that I found like really enlightening. So thanks for that. We'll, of course, have a link in the notes for those listening who want to grab that full report, and you should. But let's start high level and then drill down. So tell me about the state of partnership ops report that you wrote and why you put it together and how it came to be. Yeah, I think one of the um, big reasons is this space is in such flux. So we're seeing a lot of innovation around the business model in terms of going from that classic reseller channel and realizing that partners can help all the way through the sales funnel from um, raising brand awareness to prospecting and ultimately to retention and upselling. And so we really wanted to take a look and see where the industry is now, because there's a lot of perception and anecdotal data. Um, the tech stack that partnerships people are using is rapidly changing. There was 9 billion invested from private equity in 2021. So we're seeing a big explosion in the space. And we really wanted to try to understand what our partner team's struggling with, how are organizations leveraging partner teams, and what does the operations look like that you need to power this business model? 
And the tech stack, right? There's so many internal and external stakeholders that go into um, making partnerships successful. So it's a real coordination problem and, and technology can be hugely beneficial, but it can also be extremely messy. Yeah. Asher, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I would say the reason why Partnership Leaders partnered with HubSpot and Catalyst was because when we talk with the leaders in our community, we realized that they were doing a lot of the operational work, which was inhibiting them from doing strategic work, which is executive level stuff. And so we said, let's partner again, because we're all in partnerships and create a high quality piece of content that allows companies to really dig, dig deeper into the issues of running programmatic partner programs and taking them to scale and actually investing in partner operations. I definitely loved that you took the partnership approach to creating this report. It was fantastic. And now one of the first interesting questions you asked in the report was about the types of partnerships companies are employing a diversity that you see kind of reflected in this show and perhaps heard in my introduction. And for our listeners, what were some of the different kinds of partnerships that you noted in your survey and what conclusions can you draw about them? Yeah, it was really interesting to see that now um, for companies that are under the enterprise size, that technology partnerships, which by the way, depending on what space you're in, you might go by ISV partnerships, you might call them product partnerships, but really partnerships that um, are based around an integration between two different um, systems. Those are the most popular and it really makes sense because of the SaaS explosion. Um, they were also deemed to be the most important for, for companies that were less than 2001 employees. For the enterprise companies, they still chose resellers as their most important partners and then solution partners and technology partners um, were tied for second. So I think that's something um, to keep an eye on, no matter where you are in your partner journey, to really understand the importance of, of that partner type. But I think other types of partners that are super important are solution partners who may help to implement your product or can help to manage it over time, essentially, and make sure that your customers are getting the most out of it. Um, we also have affiliate partners, right, which really are at the top of the funnel. They're helping to bring you new customers. And then referral partners, which are different than affiliate. People often confuse them. Affiliate is more of a scaled marketing type of partner. So you are sharing links usually um, to drive people to your partner. But the referral is let's give a direct intro which works well um, within the context of other partner types, which is technology partners can give each other referrals. Solution partners can give other solution partner re referrals. Um, I think that's another takeaway. A lot of these partner types, you'll often have one organization being three or four different types of partner to you. Yeah, I, that's something that I noticed that importance of integrations here on, at Agora Pulse, we're a SaaS company and it's something we hear from our sales team, from their prospects all the time. One of the first questions we're asked is, well, who do you integrate with? What integrations do you have? I think you linked to a MarTech survey that showed how just how important integrations are in that SaaS space. Asher, did you have anything to add? No, I would just say uh, it was because of our community, we could kind of tell that the, the world is moving towards integrations. And, uh, um, and it, it makes sense because like, more and more companies want to figure out how their workflows or like how their people's day jobs and the tools that like attach to those day jobs have connect with each other. So it was good to see this data point reflected in the report. Yeah, it was very and interesting. I think something meta about the report too is one of the questions we asked is when you're buying a piece of partner technology, what is the most um what influences your decision and what people said overwhelmingly was the most important factor is, does it integrate with other systems? So we, we already knew that about marketing technology where we have over 9,000 systems at play, right? We already knew when you're looking to replace a piece of marketing software, integration is the number one factor. So it was interesting to see that validated that in the partner technology space, which is obviously much smaller at that stage, it's still the most important factor. Absolutely. So let's talk money. When reviewing the partnership programs and most notably, which programs are driving the most revenue, you shared a conclusion about 
programmatic allocation of resources. And, he, and I said, I'd be nice. I'm going to give you the stat. You found that organizations doing that, they saw 26% of their revenue coming from partners. But what wasn't clear to me in the report was what was meant by programmatic allocation of partnerships. Could you explain what that means and what other conclusions you might have found regarding the implementation of programs? We, we did that on purpose, by the way, so people would ask the Excellent. question. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. <laughs> Ensuring we could go on a series of podcasts after Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So you got to answer the question. Actually, sure, yeah. So, oh, you go, ahead. Go, ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Take it to Nella. Go ahead. Yeah, I think this is so important. So the programmatic allocation of resource is every partner program, right, has certain benefits that they're going to be offering to their partners. And these are go-to-market benefits, but they're also technical benefits. For example, um, insight into the product roadmap, help on their integration. If someone else builds it, you still need to help with your APIs, give back advice. And a lot of programs are just doing this in an ad hoc manner. So you see partners start co-selling, right? And people start co-marketing together, but it's often really the squeakiest wheel. So the partner that is best at navigating the org and being very pushy um, or just happens to know someone, they worked with them at another company. And so they're co-marketing together. That is an ad hoc distribution of resources. But as you scale, right, that's, never going to be the best way to optimize your program. So as programs get more mature, they start to look and say, how do we prioritize partners and decide who we want to invest the most in? Who gets the, you know, the very hands-on touch gets bigger co-marketing initiatives, more co-selling. And then as you go down to the lower touch partners, um, you design that experience with fewer resources. So I think when a partner program you're never going to have 100% of your resources allocated by those program terms. But for what, and the way we phrase the questions, are you allocating most of your resources programmatically or most of them just ad hoc? And as you noted, we found that the ones that have the mature programs and are doing that in an intentional and strategic way are driving the most revenue from their partner programs. Got it. So if I wanted to, do co-marketing ebooks. That's that's how I'm going to do partnership with with technology SaaS providers in my space. Instead of just you know deciding to do one here, one there, I would say we're going to do one a quarter in 2023 with these kinds of partners. That would be, I, I, if I'm understanding correctly, an example of programmatic allocation. And I'd have decided in advance, you know, what that involves, how much money we need, time, and so on. Is that right? Yeah, if you decided um, up front, this is the criteria of how we're going to pick which partners can have this opportunity with us. And then obviously the ideal formation is you tie those criteria to your strategic priorities of a company and then extend that out past ebook to all your co-marketing with partners um, and co-selling and kind of dovetails those together. But exactly right in terms of like what it would look like across one one bucket. Got it. Cool. Yeah, I, I can give a different example. The oh, yeah. if you look at most companies that have are following the account based sales and marketing program, right? They have an annual process around where they would look at their tier one, tier two, tier three accounts. So there's tiering of accounts, right? There's an account planning process that exists, right? And then the marketing team comes up with entitlements for each one of those tiers. Those entitlements include. Are we going to invite these people to experiences? Are we going to comp their tickets? Are we going to go to uh, to our conference? Are we going to send them gifts? Are we going to send them eBooks? And so, like th those entitlements there, right? So, so if you look at the tiering process and the entitlement process, so we're just calling the entitlement process the programmatic spend. Now, the example that you gave, right? Uh, where you're like, hey, I'm going to have four different ebooks and they're just going to be on a calendar. To me, that's like a campaign calendar or a content calendar, right? But how are you going to activate that content with which partner you're going to go activate? Are you going to give some people podcasts versus some people a, um, a a book signing thing? Like, Like there could be other ways, right? But what we're advocating for is that right as soon as you have a little bit of repeatability in your program, because what happens is these partner programs start as an experiment, right? Like, like there's like seven different partners. Or, or I'll give the typical B2B uh, venture back uh, scenario, right? 
uh, funding announcement is made, and then and then five different partners call the CEO up and say, hey, we'd love to partner with you. The CEO goes, well, I don't really know who to work with this. Let me go hire a partnership person. And then they go fire a partnership leader. And then that person comes in and does a whole bunch of like wacky jobs, right? Because they're just trying to figure out how to how to create some revenue, right? And then and then they're just doing ad hoc like experimentation. But at some point in time, once there is a line of sight to revenue, there is then a slight line of sight to repeatability. And then once the repeatability kicks in, you should be looking at tiering partners and you should also be looking at programmatic spend because that whole motion is going to put some stress on the organization because the organization is also trying to figure out their direct market, uh, direct go to market repeatability. I think actually you just described what happened when I was hired. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's I'm you, it's it's all, the time, all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's still happening. But I want to turn now to one of the another the next topic that you talked about in the report. You're discussing deficiencies in partner programs, and at that point, you'd reported that 71% of organizations are unable to track the full ROI of partner activities due to those deficiencies. What were some of those issues, and and why are they having such an impact on reporting? I think one of the big deficiencies was actually the lack of internal expertise on partner operations. So partner operations specifically is a much newer field. If you look around to try to find a senior leader, it's hard. That talent is in demand because you need someone who understands RevOps, but who also understands partnerships, right? And ideally understands whatever particular space you're in because partners always looks a little bit different. So it, it's really hard. And I think when you don't have that expertise, as Asher said, it often ends up being the partner leader who has to take that on because they are the ones that know if you can't prove ROI, your partner your program won't be long for this world because when things get tough, your executives are going to cut it. And so it's a struggle to take that on if you're not already an ops person, it's, it's a very hard problem because the partner tech stack itself is relatively immature. We have some mature products that were built for the reseller channel, but all the newer ecosystem tools, many of them were founded two or three years ago. So it requires a lot of work. And so that was definitely listed as the biggest blocker. But then the other two, which I'm sure you've heard from other guests before is internal alignment across other departments and executive buy-in. And mind you, I think these tie back to the lack of being able to show the ROI, of course, because that's what you need in order to get executive buy-in and also to get other stakeholders saying, hey, we want to change our processes to roll in partners. Yeah, and yeah. I would just add to the to this the the leader side, the partner leader side of this is not enough leaders are pushing rigor up front because if a sales leader comes in, the first thing they do is they say sales process stage one, two, three, four, five. Here's how we measure. Here's how conversion rate looks like. There's enough empirical data in the marketplace that are on, are around how much time each, each and opportunities should stay in each stage. Right. There's not, there's, there's, they have, they have rigor. That rigor is just not widely uh, I would say executed inside of companies today, but it's the partner leader resp responsibility because then they do they do this like shiny object syndrome thing, right? Where they're like this partner, that partner, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and I, I just feel like if there was more rigor established up front, then this problem wouldn't exist and they would effectively be able to say like, we're going to get revenue, then we're going to get repeatability, then we're gonna then we're gonna push all bucket all of the stuff uh, push all the stuff with rigor and that's gonna equal resources because the other executives are doing the same thing right the marketing executive is doing the same thing the customer success executive is doing the same thing and the the sales executive is doing doing the same thing so if they just do the same thing they're gonna find an unlock on resources and do you think that's just a reflection of the immaturity of the partnership industry because I know that was a kind of a recurring theme in the report. Yeah, so the, the qualitative side of this thing would be that there are a lot of, let's call it partner leaders that have the channel background and channel was just looked at a very, uh, was looked at a very transactional way, right? So the, the channel leaders were just acquisition leaders in a way. And in most cases, they were um, 
outside or field SDRs in a way, right? Because like some of them carried Corda, some didn't, some found opportunities, some didn't. Like there was just a lot of like, like, but the partner leaders are actually looking at the customer journey and also implementing the partner journey along the customer journey, which means there's a pre-sales part of the journey and then there's a post-sales part of the journey, right? And then how does this like journey look like and how do we like augment this journey with the customer journey and bring these like, let's say, quote unquote, two funnels together. And that when that happens, like if you just do that in a loosey-goosey manner, you're going to confuse everybody in the organization, right? And then when that happens, five executives go complain to the CEO about the partnership partner program. And guess what gets next? The partner yeah. program. Yeah, it's okay to say exactly. it's really okay because like because like we're making this, but now you have like a whole generation. I mean, there's 300 of them in partnership leaders, right? That these people are not. You're not going to find them to be like, hey, do you want to go for a happy hour or something like that? They don't do that. They 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 are trying to figure out like how do we become like partner CROs if you want to call it or partner operators, right? They're like, here are the metrics. Here's how we do it. And a lot of the work, thanks to Kelly and like uh, uh, stuff that HubSpot is supporting us with, is just pushing in. How do you use these tools now to orchestrate your partner program? Actually, Kelly just did. Did you already do this? The the how do you run your partner program on uh, HubSpot yet, or or is it coming up? Um, that's next week. Okay, yeah. So yeah, so they're actually doing like that. Yeah. So 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 the work that Kelly and HubSpot are actually like doing to help a whole like I would say generation of partner leaders implement rigor in their in their system, I think will actually is like solve this problem. I love this conversation and I love the segue that you just teed up for me because you're talking about the approach from, from channel partners and how they're not really attributing uh, and they're not putting in the rigor, like you said. And I've got a message from our CMO who's talking about basically the same thing when it comes to social media and shame on us because social media is not new. Social media has been around for a long time and we're yeah. not treating it like the channel we should. So let's hear it from Daryl Prale. It's the Arc de Triomphe. Can you imagine if you're in charge, if you're the CMO of Marketing Paris? What are your main channels? Wow, there's the Arc de Triomphe, there's the Eiffel Tower, there's the Louvre. Those are your channels you're going to use to drive tourism dollars in. Okay, now, but you're not the CMO of Paris. In fact, you're the CMO of your company, product, service. So what are your main channels? Well, I'm going to guess there are things like pay-per-click, maybe trade shows, events, maybe content. Those are all pretty predictable, right? Let me ask you this question. Are you treating social media as a main channel? By the way, only 1.8% of you today measure social media and can prove an ROI in that investment. HubSpot and Gartner say social media is the number one channel to invest in this year. Are you doing it? If not, I can tell you why. You're not doing it because you don't have the tools, you don't have the mentality, and that's okay. We've got you covered. You change the mentality, we'll give you the tool. Where Pulse tracks all the ROI for you. One place to manage all your social media activity, your number one channel, change your success. Treat social media as a channel, one CMO to another. My name is Daryl. I'm with Agora Pulse. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Let's talk partner technology. Now, Agora Pulse. Wait, wait. Before yeah. we go there, can we just yeah. talk about what, what Daryl just said? Yeah. It's actually a fantastic point, right? And I'll uh, we'll take a little bit of a segue from like partnerships and just to like podcasting, for example, right? And so I'll tell a story. So I was the CRO of this company called Demand Matrix. And I joined this company and literally like we are in COVID. And I'm like, fantastic. A company is going to go down on my watch. My entire record is ruined, right? And so because, you know, what was happening back then is like outbound was done. Like nobody was speaking about outbound. Like you could get executives if you call them around 425, 427 in the afternoon or even like 515. Like, I mean, we had the, the metrics around this uh, this dial to connect, yeah. Um, and so one person on my on my team basically said, hey, let's do podcasts because people are still coming on podcasts, right? So long story short, we did what Daryl said and we basically mapped out the entire podcast like process like it was literally like a podcast pr process right it has stages in it and we went from um discovery which is like the first podcast meeting to a deal and when we were done with the process we realized we we invested 40k in the in the podcast and we saw 1.4 million dollar source return from the podcast 
And so, so, so what Daryl's saying absolutely is the right thing. It's just, again, we go back to the rigor, right? A lot of us do this as a, as a education slash like entertaining or maybe call it an edutainment channel, right? Mm -hmm. But like, if you build a process behind it, you know, like you can actually get a pretty, pretty good ROI. Oh, for sure. I had a previous guest, Adrian McIntyre. You listeners, you go back and listen to this past episode with Adrian and he produces podcasts for other brands and they have a very, very specific process that they go through. And the whole idea there isn't to get a million followers. You're not going to get that as a B2B brand. That's, that's a pie in the sky. But what you will be able to do is sit down with the CMO of a target brand. This is basically account-based mm -hmm. marketing, right? Sit down with that CMO and develop a relationship with him or her and then nurture that relationship after the interview because you're repurposing the podcast and you're sharing the episodes and you're making them look and sound fantastic. And yep. you can seed questions in the podcast and follow up with them after the fact. Say, hey, we were talking about this in that interview and I noticed you said that. And I don't know, that's something that we can help you with if you're open to having that conversation. It was really a brilliant approach. And to your point, you know, they could measure exactly you know, how many conversations did they have? Yep. Where did those lead to from there? How much business? Yep. How many dials do you need to get to the first conversation? I mean, like the whole thing can be operationalized. And if you do it, like, you know, you actually turn podcast into a, into a revenue generating activity and you can just see all this and you can just do first touch, right? You can basically see podcast source uh, revenue and, uh, you know, I guess we're about to talk about like partner source revenue and stuff like that too, but like this channel actually works. <laughs> Yeah, and maybe I'm doing it right here with this podcast. Totally. Right <laughs> Kelly has Asher, more money than Asher, I do. I'll just, I'll just say that straight up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so let's let's talk tech. Uh, I was going to say that, you know, at Agora Pulse, I've got a PR on system for channel partners I'm using. It's first promoter, and I've been exploring how to employ things like real, uh, reveal and crossbeam so I can work more closely with partners and sales and marketing efforts and as a team of one within a company of under 200 employees, my tech stack seems to align with your report findings. But what caught my eye was there was a statistic that over half of the companies using at least one partner tech system were driving 26% more revenue from partners. So the question is, why do you think that is? I think because if you use it right, then you are going to get so much um, by way of efficiency and actionable data. And it's just going to be able to not only drive more revenue producing activity, it's going to help you to track it. So it's, I think it's twofold and worth adding the benefit. There's also the self-selection, right? People who are farther along the journey and have um more intelligence around partnerships have investigated these tools and availed the ones um, that are useful into their tech stack. Um, so I think that's part of it as well. But I really do think it's, um, you know, the bespoke high touch relationships can be valuable, but they're not going to scale. It's, it's too resource intensive and it's always just going to be a bucket of partners. When you want to take it to the next level, you need technology. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And again, it's that underlying theme of the more mature your organization is overall and with partners specifically, the more time and resources and attention you can devote. I went through an exercise early 2022 where I needed a new virtual event platform. And so I went and reached out to all the major virtual event platforms or something we were talking about before the show, right? With... Um, Hopin. Well, I did sales demos with Hopin and Hublo and Cvent and Kaltura and 20 other platforms. And that was like all that I did that month because it was so time consuming. And so for a partner operations department where you just have one or two people, they don't have time to look at all the other tools that are out there. They don't have time to think about, you know, how could we streamline what we're doing? Is there another tool? If that's not brought to their attention, yeah, that's going to be a challenge. Ashley, did you have anything to add to that? I'm just surprised there's not podcast operations. Maybe after this podcast, there's going to be podcast operations coming up too. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> but it's yeah, true. That's though, definitely like, a big thing. If you felt the pain of like bringing all these tools together and just like getting your partner, like day partnering done in a day, um, and you then find a tool, you're going for the tool because if you think about it, there's what, Kelly, there's what, 232 tools and the, 
in the stack right now? 253 the last time yeah, David Bain released, okay. uh, released the landscape. <laughs> All right, so let, let's just say there's, there's 300 tools, right? I would pause it and say 285 of them were built like 10 years ago. Yeah. And so, so the modern tooling is actually better integrated into the systems of record that comp sales and marketing teams are using. And so when you have that, there's a better user experience, which means the tool actually fits into your workflow, which means it helps you get your job done faster because you're not adopting a legacy workflow and like trying to figure out how they used to do things 15 years ago. You're like, this is how things work today. My tool works with me. Fantastic. I'm going to get my job done. I'm going to push back on that, though. The, I think the integrations of the newer tools are very immature. So while they have built um, integrations to Salesforce and HubSpot and kind of the systems of record, in general, they're still pretty thin. They don't do what, all that they need to do. And I think that we're going to see big change in that around the next two to three years. But I think their advantages, even though they're lighter tools, they are designed, as Asher said, for the workflows of today, not the workflows of yesterday. So um, in a lot of cases, it's going to be the better option. You're just going to have to support it with your own systems, processes, and honestly, probably at scale dev work. That's one of the things that kind of excited me. By the way, Kelly does this all the time. She will like, disagree with me. And they'll be like, oh, wow, here's one point that he said out of like the whole thing that he said, which actually makes sense. <laughs> That's why I brought Kelly on the show. Exactly. You know, that's, <laughs> why we, that's why we do these things together. Like it's just a fun, much better setup when we do these things together. <laughs> Someone has to fact check you, Asher. We don't, exactly. We don't want fake news spreading. <laughs> well, it's not fake news, it's just fake tech, you know? Because <laughs> that's what we're, we're getting to right now. <laughs> yeah, but I was excited because the report the un one another the underlying theme that I picked out was that partnership programs are maturing. They are getting more mm -hmm. popular. Brands are investing yep. more money. And so to take that comparison to the virtual event space again, due to the pandemic, the virtual event industry exploded and resources poured into those platforms. And that was one of the reasons why I did that exercise last year was because there had been so many changes in the previous 18 months, so many improvements and developments to virtual event tech that I needed to go back and do my due diligence. You know, the Hey Summit and, and many other platforms that I'd used years prior were totally different now. So I'm excited that hopefully that's happening. Yep with the partnership tech sp space. Now, when yeah, and I think that problem is yeah. real about um, the time that it takes to keep up when you have a space where you have rapidly changing tech. And I would say, you know, that's a good argument for being active in the community and joining organizations like partnership leaders because people have already done the work, right? And you can just post and say, hey, what did, what did you assess on this? What was the matrix you used? Because as you said earlier, taking 20 meetings where you're getting the demos and doing all that due diligence yourself, if that's not your full-time job, it's a lot of bandwidth. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Now let's talk about key performance indicators. Because I thought it was fascinating, not only how many different KPI were being tracked, but how the number and which metrics tracked depended on the size of the partnership team. Can you kind of walk us through what you found with regard to KPIs? Confusion? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think unsurprisingly, right, um, because of the traditional channel model, source revenue was still the KPI that was being used most pervasively. Having said that, influenced revenue was, was used by the majority of companies. So I think that was an interesting finding because that gets into the... Um, more variable ways that partners can help along the customer journey that Asher was referencing. Um, so I do think that was interesting. And we saw more mature programs using more KPIs, which I think is another reference to the fact that they're recognizing the diversity of both partner types, but also partner points on the customer journey and how, um, their teams need to be driving not just the sourced, which is like the traditional model of either you just got in a new net new account or someone resold it for you. But how can you use tools like Reveal and Crossbone, for example, 
to collaborate on open opportunities or honestly just to influence the deals and drive retention um, after you have joined customers. Yeah, yeah, that I'm, statistic on influenced revenue is is literally something I'll, I'll be sharing with my executive team because they recently poo pooed the whole idea of any kind of influenced <laughs> revenue. I'm like, mm, mm, no, <laughs> this is what the bigger, smarter, more mature brands are doing. We need to do more of that. I'm about to get kicked off of this podcast in 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. I got the button ready. <laughs> So, so, okay. So, so it's, it's interesting because like every podcast that we do, you know, this is the benefit of like doing podcasts together with a partner, which I would, by the way, highly recommend that people find somebody who's going to be on the journey with them on doing multiple podcasts, because you can actually like pick different points from different podcast episodes that you do together and bring together. Right. And so I think three podcasts ago, uh, that Kelly and I did, we got into this like partner source versus partner influence, like, like this whole like conversation, and because my background is sales, I'm like, forget influence. It doesn't really matter. Like, you know, like who cares, right? But then I also have the benefit of like, uh, uh, or for good fortune of like working at a band base. And so I actually had to learn like how marketing works. And so my, 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 my way of like rationalizing this at a board level or even like at an executive level is there are like, I think one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different things that came up in the report from source rev uh, revenue all the way to increase retention. And you can actually take just what's written there. In, and this is, by the way, for people listening, this is page 40 in the report. Um, you can actually create a partner scorecard from this mm -hmm. and take all the sourced and sourced-ish type of things like number of active integrations, et cetera, et cetera, partner profitability and put them in the partner sales bucket. And then take the influence revenue and all that stuff, put it in traffic and leads generated, put it in the partner marketing bucket, and then take the increased retention and the customer satisfaction and partner attached account stuff that's in the report, put it in the partner success bucket. And there's going to be a through part through through channel partner success motion. We're going to talk about that as Gainsight gets into the market, right? Um, and now you have a partner scorecard. And so, but at the end of the day, when you get go into a meeting with a CFO like that person and most CFOs are very dry, right? Do not care about any type of influence stuff. They're just looking at everything because they're the way they've been taught, the way they speak is like a p &L statement, right? So like, and, and on a PL statement, there's no bucket for like influence. And so, so that's my like new way of thinking is like, you have some partner sales metrics. You, if you want influence, put them in a partner marketing um, bucket, but definitely like create a scorecard and then present that. Because that then gives your executives a holistic view of what this partnership thing is all about. Ding, ding, Kelly, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're not helping Mike, whose CMO is probably listening to this podcast. Exactly. I, know, I, know. I know, that's why I said I'm, I'm like 30 seconds in, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get kicked off of this podcast. I'll, I'll just edit that part out, that. it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> So I think what um, Asher is correct about is that, especially now when the economy is really tough, sourced revenue is always going to be the gold standard of proving out value. But the truth of the matter is influenced um, revenue has a huge impact on the bottom line. And that's, and that's a fact. And organizations that are more mature have built out models where they can determine the relative weight of different types of influence and they recognize it up to the C-suite level. And people who are already in those organizations um, are in a better spot currently right now because they're already seeing the value and they've already proved it out with enough data. If you're starting at the top of the journey right now, it's a lot harder because everybody's kind of in conservative mode, risk adverse, trying to um, really focus on the shorter term, right? That's just human nature. When times are tough, people start to think shorter term. And so it is gonna be a more challenging thing to implement in your organization right now, but we do know um, that it is having an impact. So in a sense, you're doing it at your own peril if you just turn away from that fact. It's kind of when marketers talk about dark social, right? Mm. There's a lot of stuff that we know can't be tracked, but um, in the aggregate it has a huge influence. Same thing with brand, right? Brands, marketing teams have long been in this position where you cannot um, prove it out because there's always too many um, exogenous variables happening at the same time when you make a brand change. 
But we all know that brand has a huge impact and positioning has a huge impact in in your ultimate success. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, you know, smart executives and smart organizations will see that this form of influence really tremendously impacts the growth of the company in the long term. Um, So I would say ignore it at your own peril, but I also nod to the fact of um, people's mindset, especially now, you might be stuck in a company where you're just not going to make headway. Yeah, I can agree with things that that you're both saying. And we're going to keep coming back to that point where the less mature the company is, the more challenged it's going to be to accomplish these kinds of things. If you're not mature in your partner tech stack, you're probably not mature in other areas of your company. So are you really attributing all the traffic and revenue that you're getting correctly, right? How do you know what is partner influenced and how do you know the impact over time of that yeah. partnership channel? I mean, th- those are, those are questions that, yeah, a lot of companies can't and, ask. And, and did you actually then go and collaborate with like the marketing team? Cause they actually have a very good system set up for, for, to track influence. Uh, actually question to Kelly, does HubSpot do partner influence? So you're talking about a couple of different types of influence, right? Like you marketing can um, run some of the influence, but you also have uh, sales influence, right? So if you bring in a partner who provides a deal and tell, but they didn't source the deal, that is partner influence. Um, So I think that it's going to have to align with other departments and it, and it is a good call. It's maybe other departments have tools and frameworks and even systems that you can, can co-op. Um, but I will just sidestep the question about what how HubSpot is doing internally. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just asked because the earnings report actually says fifty percent of revenue comes from partners, and I don't think that's like like influenced revenue. I think that's just like that like pretty close to source revenue. Um, so I will say we liter- we just revamped our solution partner program because we wanted to make it more um, aligned with recognizing our partners who aren't sourcing as many deals, but they are servicing the HubSpot accounts over time, right? So that we we did make that change because we were more focused on who's sourcing these deals. Um, and we see the long-term value of the partners who, may not be bringing in that many new deals, but they may be managing a lot of HubSpot accounts and managing them well and retaining those customers. That's extremely valuable to us as a company. So I do think we are aware of the different ways that partners can bring value and and we are trying to um, continue to update our programs and our way of tracking to reflect that. Yeah, I, I actually think that like as time goes by, we will have like this whole concept of partner success and the partner success KPIs will actually then drive programs in the customer success umbrella through partners. And and this this lane that you just talked about will actually become even more clearer there. And then there are resources already available in the, let's call it chief uh, customer officer organization to then, and, and budget, by the way, to like devote to partners. And I think it's coming. We're We're still stuck with the, as I said, the the pre-sales piece of it, because most people that are in partnerships and even in tech partnerships, right, come from the channel world. Yeah, I, I'll give a shout out to HubSpot because we implemented HubSpot 18, 24 months ago at Agora Pulse, and we were able to quickly mature our attribution model. And we're starting to get to the point where we're seeing partnership influenced deals mostly again with the channel partnerships like you've been talking about you know but as we're starting to bring in you know sales partnerships using like reveal mm-hmm. and cross me like we talked about those metrics are going to be there you know those there's just fields that we can toggle and and, and add to the reporting so it, it is able to tell that uh as a platform so that's okay, I'll, I'll, I'll end with this one thing because i think this is gonna be the learning from this podcast right it's like because it's interesting because we were in another webinar and somebody actually asked like what is what is sourced revenue right like like how does it actually work right and so maybe that like at some point i'm kelly you me and mike should do another session and like like june july this year and talk about this thing but there are specific ways that you source revenue from your partners and there are playbooks already built and then when you go and think about like what what is the influence playbook you'll see that a lot of those influence playbooks are very similar to the marketing playbooks that already exist. 
and 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 so it may not be like like again i'm just uh, riffing with you guys uh, and gals right uh that the, it, it may not be like, like what we're talking about may be true or even lower than like extremely large companies is just we just haven't found a way to actually collaborate more closely with the marketing teams and take their playbooks that have already already been established uh, and then uh, you know uh, uh, changing them or adopting some of that stuff for our stuff yeah that's that's exactly right yeah it's all about learning Should we get Daryl on this podcast <laughs> yeah right you know we don't have to reinvent the wheel you know, totally. you know, standing on the shoulders of greatness and so on. So is there anything else real quick that you want to add? Anything else that stood out from the report that we didn't already touch on? I, I would say the, the, the this whole reporting structure thing was a very interesting one, right? Like, uh, again, no surprise there that like most people report to the CROs. And oh, yeah, then, the organizational structure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, and, and then most teams report to CR, CROs, and then the second is like CEOs. But I think there is a model where the partner, uh, let's call it leaders, right? Like, let's say you have a chief partner officer, but then all these direct reports actually live in other teams and their dotted line, or they live in under him or her and their dotted line to other leaders, right? There's a model there that hasn't fully been deployed yet, right? Um, but, but, it, but, it, but I think it's, it's coming and it just depends on like, you know, how strongly does the CEO actually believe in partnerships? Yeah, totally agree with that. Kelly, anything else you wanted to add? No, I just double down on what we kind of covered here that, um, you know, thinking about the stuff strategically and putting an operational eye to it and a programmatic eye to it is what's going to move you forward no matter what stage you're at. If you're younger, it just won't be as robust and built out, but it's still important to think about it strategically from day one so that you have that mindset in place and you can move it forward on those wheels instead of letting things be kind of the wild west. And then you find you have 200 partners, 20 of them who are active and, and trying to figure out how to recalibrate is a lot tougher than if you think about it strategically from day one. Couldn't agree more. Love it. Guys, this has been such a fun geek out session. I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I want you to be able to tell the folks uh, where they can learn more about you, your organizations, where they can connect with you. Uh, Asha, I'll let you start first. Oh, well, let's Kelly start first. Then. Okay, Kelly, you. you go first. Uh, I'm pretty easy. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, always happy to connect and chat there. Uh, you can go to HubSpot.com and uh, if you want to learn more about HubSpot and our, and our partner programs. If you're in MarTech, service tech, um, or sales tech, always happy to connect on that. Well, partnership leaders needs to pay Kelly more so she can say so we can also find her in the PL Slack. <laughs> That's true. I am always in partnership leader Slack. You can DM me there. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes people are like, you're in our Slack more than you're in your own Slack, you know? So it's like, <laughs> well, we, we totally appreciate all the support that she had and HubSpot are giving us. Um, for, for me, um, you know, partnership leaders is www.partnershipleaders.com. Again, you can find me on LinkedIn, but I would highly encourage you if you're in partnerships to think about joining a community where you have a safe space to have the conversation or, or maybe have the hard conversations. And you'll find like deep connections because the people who are at the leading edge of building modern partner programs are all in there. They're figuring it out. And we created the space for you all. And then the last plug I'll make is our conference is coming up in August uh, and it's called Catalyst and it's a home for new ideas and people, again, forming deep uh, connections. And so you can find more information about that on www.joincatalyst.com. Love it. And Catalyst, is that virtual or in person? This is in person and it's in Denver. Uh, we did it last year. We budgeted for 200 people and 450 showed up. And this year we want to actually budget for 750, but if a thousand show up, like we won't have the same problems that we had last year. Cause we literally had to tell people, no, you can't come. And that's, that's pretty, pretty sad when you're trying to create an industry conference. That's okay. That happens. That's a good problem yeah. to have, right? Too many people are interested. Love that, that was a humble brag from Asher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we no, it was, it was, it, actually, if you were the person who actually had to say no to people when they're like, 
I will pay three thousand dollars for this ticket, right? You would say, be like, then, then there's not a humble brag. It's actually sad because you're like, as a revenue leader, you're like, oh, well, there's a lot of money I could take this, right? But then you're like, well, there's the fire marshal on the other side. They're gonna kick us out, and you're like, oh man, this person is really nice. They would be awesome addition to the to the whole group. So, yes, yeah, sometimes I do humble brag, but not at this one. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Love it. I'm definitely going to look into coming to that conference and joining yeah. partnership leaders. Thank you both so, so much. Folks, that's all we've got for today. Please find us on Apple. Drop us a review. Love to know what you think. We'll see you next time. Thanks for having us. Thanks.